Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, today we have uh, one of our really favorite uh, guests. John Coma and I are going to be speaking with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. How are you doing, John and John? Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm doing great. We're mugging for the camera. <laughs> hey, John. Uh, yeah. It's good to see you again. You know, uh, fall is here, not quite yet in Southern California, but we we are technically, I think, in, in fall. And um, w my wife loves um, a squash soup, uh, not pumpkin soup, um, uh, butternut squash soup. Butternut. Mm. Yeah. That, that is her big fall uh, dish. We, we love that, although we like pumpkin soup too. But um, And so I grew some squash last year uh, over the summer and we made soup and packaged it and it's frozen. We're going to have squash soup. So, mm -hmm. but, but I would imagine there are lots of people and lots of fall um, favorites mm -hmm. in the culinary world. And you as, of course, a well-traveled food and uh, travel writer could tell me about some of them, couldn't you? I will certainly try. And, uh, and you better because we've got another 10 minutes to kill. Right. <laughs> we had just uh, put away the old Weber grill ourselves, having uh, for the entire summer cooked uh, probably 50% of our meals uh, on it um, with real charcoal, not those briquettes, you know. And it's great. And, you know, you throw a steak on there and it tastes just fabulous. And you've got corn and, and uh, you could throw that, that on there and pork chops and, and vegetables and everything. And you get and, and then you have such wonderful fruits, blueberries coming out in the summer and, and so forth and, and soft shell crabs. I mean, it, it's a it's a great season. Um, but what my wife does not want to do is to turn on the oven. And I don't blame her. Um, and roast something for an hour and a half or two hours. Or we're, we're gonna. We just did the suckling pig um, here for my birthday, which we do annually, and that goes in the oven. But everybody stays out of the kitchen because that goes on for four or five hours in the oven. So autumn is here, and there are foods that in every category make much more sense. Let's start with uh, things like the squashes. Okay. And those uh, root vegetables, which uh, start coming up. First of all, you, you, if you're lucky, the tomatoes of August will go well into September at their absolute ripest. Anybody who eats a tomato in January through even June is a jerk because, you know, even if they come in and have been gassed to be bright red and firm from California, they still have no taste whatsoever. Um, so all of the tubers, all of the squashes are coming in. Um, the watermelons have been here all summer, but those are kind of nice at the end. Um, then you have uh, truffles. Now there's two kinds of truffles, or several kinds of truffles, but truffles are in fact mushrooms of a sort. They're fungus, fungi. And uh, this is when all the wild mushrooms start to come in and you and the truffles, there's black truffles, the best of which are called Perigord truffles because they come from the Perigord region of France and are absolutely at their best. They have an aroma which is beautiful and uh, they are far more uh, easily found at a high price than white truffles. Now, white truffles are from around the region of Alba in Italy, where they are dug up by hounds. They dig up, they dig up black truffles in France with pigs that especially train and fed, fed, fed truffles in order to teach them how to find them. And in Italy, they, they train these hounds, um, and they don't care about eating them. They don't eat them. They just they get a their toy if they find some truffles or, or whatever those, those dogs like to eat. Now, white truffles have a much shorter season. They start coming in at, in late October. They don't really get all that great in November. And by the end of December, January, they are they are finished because they're they're very rare and they're extremely expensive. I mean, we're talking like twelve, fifteen hundred dollars a kilo, depending upon how the uh, nature's production uh, has uh, has provided them. Um, and you go to restaurants, Italian restaurants, and they shave it over fettuccine with butter. Those are the only two other ingredients, and what you get is a ninety dollar plate of pasta. Um, it really has to be. 
the truffle has to be really, really good and aromatic in order for you to appreciate uh, spending $90 for it. But, you know, there are a lot of idiotic people who just say I had white truffles on my pasta last night. It didn't matter what it cost. So um, there is that. Apples. Apples are at their best in early fall and uh, mid-fall when we around here um, go picking apples. Um, there are several uh, farms within half an hour of where, where I live where you go and pick apples. And last year, I swear, it was so popular in this one place here in Westchester County. It took us a half an hour after we got off the highway to get to the orchard because of the line of cars. And when we got there, this was about November 1st, October 31st, something like that. I said, we're out of apples. They're oh. out of apples. They were all plucked from the trees already. Jeez. So we got donuts and we got uh, some other stuff. We got corn, but here <laughs> you drove an hour and 45 minutes. I mean, that's how popular a pastime because they bring the kids and they have petting zoos and so forth. So apples and, and, uh, and, and uh, quince and uh, pears come in in the fall. So that, And they're just luscious and juicy and, and very, very sweet. Um, and then it is, of course, game season. And game season uh, begins. Uh, there are some very strict, strict rules, especially in Europe and in England, as to when uh, game season start and what birds and what animals you can start to uh, shoot at that uh, time. So venison runs well into the winter. You can get you can get venison, um, deer meat uh, throughout, and you can get um, uh, certain pheasants and things like that, which are more uh, easily found. But then there are uh, there's grouse shooting. Grouse season is very short. It's only a, a couple of weeks um, because there aren't that many grouse, and uh, you can't raise grouse in a pen. You can raise a lot of animals. That's one, one of the great things about autumn is that uh, these animals are only available then and you just can't grow them like chickens or, or, or even geese and uh, wild they also have a different flavor um, very specifically a wild animal um, like a wild rabbit or hare ha has a much more uh, I don't want to say intense because that might pe put people off although a grouse is a very, very intense dark meat for a bird, okay? But if this is what you like and this is what you crave, this is the only time you're gonna get it. Because the duck that you see, in the United States, you're not allowed to sell game, wild game in a store or a restaurant. So even if a uh, chef so-and-so was out with his buddies and shot venison or something, he's not allowed to serve it in the restaurant. You can't even serve um, a trout from a pristine river in Alaska, unless it's been raised <laughs> on a farm. And the same goes with salmon and bronzino and others. So this is why it's so special at fall uh, when you um, have these available only for a short time and enjoy the hell out of them. You know, what's kind of yeah. really uh, uh, interesting, this is almost like a, a, a nostalgic story. Uh, John and I both are transplants from New York originally and we've lived in several places across the country but basically we've been Californians for 30 some odd years and the uh, while we kept about having seasons of flood rain fire and mud uh, we, in Southern California where we live there's relatively mild temperatures year-round and with uh, the change of the way things are delivered we get fresh fruits and vegetables year-round uh, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be a Costco or a specialty store like we have out here, Sprouts. Uh, mm -hmm. So it seems that the nostalgia of, I remember growing up and having things that were only done in fall and winter because it was only available then because the transportation system didn't allow for uh, delivering. But I think it's losing some of that uh, uh, specialty uh, and specialness of a change of season. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you bring it back because I just haven't thought about seasonal foods as much since I've been out here because it's this, you have anything you want whenever you want and it's all really good quality. But the only things we can't get here year round are cherries mm -hmm. because they, they do have a very specific season uh, uh, out of the Pacific Northwest. I, although I suspect we can get them someplace. So it seems like... Uh, 
uh, this is going to be something that even in where you live, uh, you can get just about anything you want uh, 12 months of the year. Uh, well, actually, what, what, what we're getting is what you're getting. It's coming from California. It's of uh, varying quality. But out of season, even though the thought of having strawberries in January or tomatoes in January, isn't it great? I mean, eat them. Well, that's America for you. Well, they don't taste like much of anything. Um, and that's why people really wait for the shad row in May and the soft shells and basil. You can get basil all year round. Um, you can make pesto sauce if you want all year round. But it's not going to taste as good as it does. And, and, and Art, you, I think you put your finger on it. It's not just nostalgia. It's the anticipation. It's something, it's like, you know, the baseball season is starting April 1st. Oh, yeah, you know, then we're going yeah. to have, well, basketball is just year round. And don't they play yeah. like from September to July in, 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 in hockey? Um, the anticipation factor is, is a very real one. And nostalgia is something that in one's childhood, one remembers when these foods came in. And remember when the corn started to taste really good and sweet. Mark Twain once said, the only way to eat corn you take a pot of water out into the cornfield, light a fire under it, and put the corn in there and eat it right there in the cornfield. And he's right. <laughs> corn is a thing that well, well, I I will tell. I'm a gardener, and I will testify that that is correct. The, it does make a difference. The fresher the corn, often, well, it, it, it to, makes a big difference. It has to do with the sugar, and I, I must say that genetically or however they modified corn over the years, uh, all American corn that you even buy at a supermarket or a little farm stand is mm -hmm. going to be very, very sweet. Okay, but the it is a when something is is plucked um, off the cob, uh, it's the the sugar starts to disintegrate. I mean, it's just law. The thing is dying, you know. So it's not going to taste as sweet and fresh as when you just bite into it. Same with apples. I mean, apples that are being picked right now or in the fall <clears throat> are going to be gassed and put in silos, and you'll be eating those same same apples months from now. Potatoes year round. They just cold storage the uh, little buggers, and uh, you know the potatoes that are being hoed right now out on Long Island are going to be in a silo a silo somewhere. Um, you know, a silo somewhere. The great actor from the '30s. Um, they're going to be in a silo somewhere uh, right through January and February. Um, well, of course, and and that's that. Those particular foods traditionally have been grown for that reason because they they can take cold storage. You can, you know, when when you could only eat stuff that you picked fresh back in the day when there was no refrigeration. I don't you like had to be able to store certain foods, and you. Uh, but you know, Art, you said something about um, year round, and you can get it. I, I want to go back to what John said about tomatoes. Who uh, happen to overplant tomatoes every year mm. uh, for that same reason? They they are not the same store bought tomatoes, particularly in the winter. Uh, they obviously come from uh, Argentina or someplace, and they are just tasteless. They're red. They look great. But they're tasteless, as as opposed to the tomatoes that I grow. Uh, you know, they're you could never sell them in a store. <laughs> the color isn't right, and they're mangled, and they've got sometimes they've got an odd shaped. But boy, are they delicious! Yeah, I think, I think part of that is that uh, tomatoes that are coming in here year round, and also for the the sake of uh, of preserving them, uh, because you're not getting it from a farm, they're refrigerated. And I think that pulls some of the flavor out. I remember we, we had lunch together a couple of weeks ago and you brought uh, a ton of uh, uh, like grape tomatoes and, and uh, uh, larger uh, uh, tomatoes. And they were great. In fact, after lunch, I was driving home about a half hour and I probably finished off half of them because they were so good. But not to be a total downer on this whole thing, uh, I need to thank uh, uh, John Mariani uh, for... Uh, reigniting a bit of nostalgia. I do have a favorite seasonal food, even though I've been in California for 30 years in a non-seasonal uh, uh, area of the country, is chestnuts in Manhattan. Oh, I was going oh, through my In a head. paper bag, in a paper bag. They don't taste the same uh, if you make them at home. They've got to be in a paper bag done over uh, either charcoal or whatever they uh, do it in, and too few in a too small bag. But delicious.
and I, I want to give you the recipe. Uh, chestnuts are so easy to screw up. They come out too hard. They come out too soft. You can't get the shell off. Uh, here you go. You go. First of all, you do have to split the skin, okay, with a, with a knife. Put them in a steamer, or just put them in a, you know, not not a boiler. Just steam them for like two minutes, and then roast them for twenty minutes, and they'll be perfect. Perfect. Yeah, Thank you. About you boys out there, but we, when we were kids, we used to take chestnuts and tie them to a string and uh, yeah. uh, compete against each other who could knock the other guy's chestnut to smithereens, but usually got the other guy's thumb. I think you have to be of a certain age to remember that. I don't know that that's done anymore. You need Mr. Potato Head. We had chestnuts on a string. <laughs> uh, this has been fun. Reminiscing about chestnuts. Roasting on an open fire. Tomatoes and... Uh, fresh fires. tomatoes from John's garden. That's right. See you soon, John. Thanks. Take care. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.